to Cycling Fashion Week, the only global podcast purely focused on cycling style, elegance, drip, lifestyle, the global trend-setting podcast in the cycling world. I am your host, Alex, back on the podcast, joined this week by my co-hosts, Italian Alex, Warren, and Tony. We almost had all five hosts this week, which would have been An exploit would have been incredible, but Skylar is out racing as she is the only racer, the only fast rider on this podcast. So you're left with Warren, Italian Alex, Universal Alex, and Tony. Gentlemen, how are you doing this week? Great. Excellent. It's good to be back. And I think more specifically, not only is Skylar racing, I think I just saw an Instagram story of her uh, shotgunning a beer. So obviously (laughs) the race must have went super well. Or super poorly. Or super poorly. I mean, either Isn't way, she, she deserves it. a race, and this is our local uh, weekly crit series. And and Skylar is basically too good in the women's race that they forced upgraded her to the what's called the late race, which is it's like the A race. Yeah, it's the A race. And so, no offense to her, I think she'd be in tough. There's some very fast people in that, like talking former pro rider or Conti pros and stuff like that. So, yeah. Well. On some bigger news about me. <laughs> That's what it's all about. It's yeah, Tony. This is the Tony Fashion Week podcast. Yeah, I fucked up, guys. I fucked up big time. I will, I ordered some stuff, some cycling related things, including a chain from Amazon, <laughs> and uh, you know it's supposed to be Prime delivery next day. Famous cycling retailer Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. I wanted the gold KMC chain, and it, it was the best place to find it. And also, it was supposed to come the next day. And so I wanted to do a little drivetrain cleanup, take some things off, get a good clean of the uh, pulley wheels, you know, really, really um, get at it. Uh, and usually the best way to do that is to have your chain off. So I took off the chain that was on it uh, with the hope, with the assumption that the next day my chain would come and I would just put that new chain on and I'd be ready to ride. And it didn't come. It never shipped. Uh, they haven't told me when it's going to ship. Um, so now my bike has no chain on it. It's not like you live uh, two blocks away from two separate bike stores. Where you can... I'm not going to either of those stores, Warren. You know I don't support. You know I don't support local bike stores. I support Amazon. <laughs> as a as a regular reader of SheldonBrown.com, you should know better than to order chains from Amazon. You should uh, go to more specialized retailers, perhaps. So summer is drawing to a close, at least here in Canada. It's pretty short summer. Um, I guess, how has your summer of riding been? Uh, I think we're, we're at that point in the summer where you can, you can look back and evaluate if you're satisfied with your riding this summer and, and look forward to the fall. How would you, uh, how would you say this summer has been? Uh, you know, I feel I'm not going to complain cause I have had a ample free time to ride and I feel like I have ridden as much as normal though. My, I haven't done as many like 150 K territory rides this year as i have the last couple of years which i think is all right because you know i feel like once you get past 130 it's just like i just want to go home the frustrating thing about cycling is i know i'm like stronger cyclist this year but i don't feel stronger i still feel like <laughs> slow compared to some of our local people and stuff so that's frustrating but you know on the whole i'd say it's been decent summer of riding so for me, definitely one of my weaker summers of riding, a mix of, and here's the excuse train come, coming up, but a mix of just bad weather when I've had time to ride, mm-hmm. constant rain, parenting, work, summering in Sardinia, a mix of all these circumstances, good and good and good and less good. I get the, the weather part's not so good, but the other ones are pretty good. Uh, just kind of conspiring against uh, my my time devoted to writing, so it definitely hasn't been the best. I think Tony has perhaps been in a similar situation, and as a result, Tony and I have been playing a lot of tennis uh, this summer as a substitute to writing, which I, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but that's kind of been the story for us. I mean, I'm still proud of myself for how much writing I did, considering I have a, a well, no longer a newborn, but a, a a new new baby at home that obviously takes a a lot of responsibility. Um, so I still have been able to get out for maybe more than I think uh, I had assumed. But uh, one kind of downside to cycling is it's a it, it's a sport you want to do for a long you know a long duration at a time, a, you know a couple hours. 
And so I think tennis for me is sort of picked up again. And uh, Alex and I have been playing because, you know, if you go hard with a good game or rally, you can get a good kind of half hour, 45 in and really feel the workout where a half hour bike ride, let's be honest, is pretty useless. Like unless you've got sort of an area where you're just doing full threshold or sprints or something, maybe even trainer can be okay. But it, it, it feels like a half hour on the bike goes by in a blink by the time you've just sort of even gotten to maybe the, the meetup spot or, you know, wherever you're going to do your laps. It's been tough, but I've still gone out there. I, I still, am, you know, get into the Fast Fridays uh, ride. And I think dad watts are real because considering how little I've been riding, I still can keep up. Not at the kind of, you know, attack sort of race section where lots of people get dropped, but in terms of the sort of uh, out and back, it's a, it, it's a, it can be a pretty high pace. We dropped a uh, an e-bike on one of the rides, which was pretty great. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm still kind of proud of myself for for how much I got out, but but not as much as obviously years past. Hopefully, uh, as the baby settles into a better schedule, maybe you know next spring. Also, Canada had like three days of summer all year, as well as even though New York got all the play because it's New York, uh, we also had terrible uh, air quality from the Quebec wildfires. It was a mix of air quality issues due to wildfires, then just straight up tornadoes and, and rain here in around Montreal. It's been it's been ridiculous this summer. Not a very nice summer. So yeah, for the little free time that, that I've had uh, to ride it the weather just hasn't cooperated. I mean we've talked we touched on like the the pragmatic reasons for why this has been a less than ideal summer for cycling but i'm just gonna get a little esoteric with it for a second and go into the the overall state of the vibe for the summer and i feel like it just has to do with the fact that the post like covid lockdown euphoria has subsided and we've kind of now finally resumed like our first normal summer and i think that compared to last summer when it felt like the first true uninhibited summer that we had and that made everything way more exciting. This summer was just like any other summer. And that doesn't necessarily make it bad, but you're obviously going to compare one summer to the one that immediately precedes it. And in that regard, it's just been less exciting. Also, are there too many cyclists? Like, I feel like there's, you know, we've talked about the boom and, you know, we talked to some uh. to these brands and a lot of them we like, we want them to do well, but it always feels like there's like, a lot of rides we would once do or rides you start and then you go like, are you going on that ride? Oh my God, it's gotten so big. There's so many people. I don't want to ride that. A bunch of them get squirrely. Like, it's just like, it feels like, which I mean, I guess it's supposed to be in the boom of COVID cycling. There was supposed to be more, but I, I don't know if because they were newer, there was less on the group rides or something, but it just feels like there's too many. Like we, we've, we've sort of carved out and i always felt I, in a way i feel bad about this because i, I you know i want to be sort of open but we've had to carve out some of our rights to be invite only because it can get you know if you kind of open it up a little bit it can just grow to this crazy number and you don't know half the people and they're just heard about it through someone that they barely know i feel like we've i feel like tony you've actually opined on this before in a previous episode i can't remember which one it is but if he's opined on this multiple yeah i was gonna say i feel like we've we've gone through this song and dance before but ultimately when it just comes to managing group rides what comes first and foremost is safety and unfortunately safety can come at the expense of excluding certain people which is terrible but ultimately everyone wants to get home after the ride at the end of the day and Sometimes that involves just really managing on a person-to-person level who's riding with you. I'm nothing if not repetitive. (laughs) Okay, big episode today. We have an interview with our repeat guests, very good friends of the podcast, Steve and Ben from Attacker, the Australian brand. They are back on the podcast to talk about their new collection, which is a very interesting collaboration with Italian brand Kappa, a brand that has a strong cycling heritage, mostly known for its soccer heritage, football for all all of our European listeners, and which, uh, you know, soccer gear having a bit of a comeback in in the fashion world. And so Attacker is launching a collaboration with Kappa. And we are going to segue right away into the interview with Steve and Ben from Attacker. All right, for our next segment, we are welcoming back very special guest maybe 
definitely top three, top two special guests. And that is Ben and Steve from Attacker. Um, they have a new collaboration out, which we'll talk about shortly, and we'll catch up with them. Ben, Steve, how are you guys going? Really well, thank you. Very how are you well. guys going? We're doing well. We're just seeing great success with the podcast. Um, you know, I, I still see a lot of people that are should be potential listeners riding around, people that, you know, just really need our help, our advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe just like a maybe just like a, a cycling fashion week little card I can give them with a with a link to attacker, and then like they can start the, start their journey there. So maybe maybe we can collab on on to, on some sort of blog that can like reference the correct socks people need to get right because that that's always sort of the seems to be the big issue comes with sort of the, the 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 details. You know, we need to improve people's general sock game. Too high, too low, often. Um, visors on helmets become a real problem. It's an epidemic in this city. Yeah. Also, I mean, I don't want to brag too much, but I look incredible in the acid lime bibs. Uh, many people have said. It, it's a showstopper for sure, Alex. You've got to be confident and, and, and a little bit brave to, to run the acid lime. Oh, I am. I am. Kudos. Do either of you guys ever wear them? Yeah. yeah. But it's been, it's, it's winter here at the moment. So oh, right. when you're wearing them with a, a, a non-matching black leg warmer underneath it's not really the right vibe they're, kind of, good. they're good for summer when you've got a half decent tan yeah pasty legs huh? that's a tough one actually because even if you had the lime matching that would be so aggressive right like the black is off so you look at the blacking oh that's off because it's not matching but if you did a lot like a lime leg warmer the with with the acid lime bibs i don't know i don't know if that's like you said you got to be confident I guess in Austra Australian winter, you can probably pull it off. In Canadian winter, that's not going to happen. No. It's true. It's not going to work with the with the shoe warmers at all. It's a tough look. Or, or you're just inside Zwifting in your acid lime bibs and no one can see you. Oh, right. <laughs> you will win that Swift crit in those acid lime bibs. No question. Yeah. So you guys are returning, which is exciting. Only our uh, second returning guest after our, our good friend, maybe one of the best friends of the podcast, David Miller who is, uh, was amazing on uh, the, the Tour de France Unchained, or uh, what, was it, what was the French, uh, Alex, the French name for it? Au, au cœur du peloton or something like that. I, I can't remember. In the yeah, heart of the peloton. So, Ben and Steve, since we spoke last, you guys got any uh, hot takes? Cycling, uh, lots happened in the cycling world. Uh, um, anything you guys uh, saw or any, any opinions that we can uh, riff off of a little bit? Yeah, the, the cycling cycling market, I'd probably ask the same question to you guys. You guys are definitely across it in terms of the fashion side of things. But the cycling market, you know, facing a few challenges these days. It's interesting to see how brands are dealing with it. The, the COVID bubble definitely burst. And yeah, it's certainly not what it, what it was. You, there's that term that we had, the COVID cyclists. Are they are they still around? Where, where have they gone? But yeah, um, yeah all in all... It's it's sort of an interesting state of flux that people are, are having to to deal with and reevaluate. So I was going to ask you guys that. I'm glad you brought it up. That was going to be one of my questions. The the uh, I'm going to say the implosion. I'm not sure if it's the implosion of the market, but definitely the cyclical changes that we've seen from the peak in COVID. How do you guys see that shaking out? Do you just see fewer brands around or kind of upstart brands that had their star during COVID and thought it was always going to be that way, just going away? Or how do you, how do you see this uh, evolving? Well, it's interesting. Right? From a business point of view, you can kind of look at some of the bigger players in the market and looking at, you know, you can see how they ordered in the back end of COVID and kind of ordered up big and now they've kind of left with all this stock and then they're doing permanent 50% off sales or whatever. And that just has a trickle down effect. And I think as a smaller brand, um, that's not really sort of the game we're playing. So I think to stand out, like we've kind of got to be more creative in a lot of ways. I think in COVID, like everyone knows there was a huge boom in cycling and you didn't necessarily have to be doing anything unique or interesting and good business and you could still get by. Whereas now I think we're going to see a lot of you know, brands like us being forced to rethink the way they're doing things and kind of, yeah, like are they really being as creative as they think they are? 
And did people in the in the industry really think the COVID boom was going to last forever or was the new normal? Or did you have, you know, in the back of your mind, the knowledge that this was a very unusual market and that things were going to normalize after? Oh, no, no one, no one really had the crystal ball. I think optimistically, a lot of brands thought this influx of, of people to cycling, people will graduate to that higher end of the market and they'll they'll sort of start buying more high-end bikes and more high-end kit and they'll progress through the ranks but that probably hasn't been the case to the extent that people thought yeah different brands perceived it differently like you we'd heard that shimano was um very conservative in in their approach and they they didn't think it was was going to be sustainable and they didn't really aggressively put on additional staff and put on additional production. They, they were a little bit more sensible about it. Whereas a lot of other brands were let's, let's go hard and make as much as we can as, as quickly as we can. And, and, and now those brands are really stuck with a glut of stock that they're trying to clear for the next at least 12 months or so, which is, it puts a strain down the chain through, through the, the retail partners, and, and all the way up to their own sites. So we were a bit more conservative with with our purchasing and stock. So we haven't had an issue of trying to get through and having to heavily discount. So um, for us, it's been, we're able to now accelerate and be more creative and, and push a bit harder with what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. So you didn't pull a, wa- a Wahoo? Yeah, I was just going to say that. Wahoo is wild. Like, like I can't believe, like, you can think that there's going to be, like, a little bit of a jump that might last a little long term. But, like, looking at the, from sort of, we're industry insiders now, but hearing from people, like, <laughs> Wahoo just somehow thought that, like, everyone was going to buy a new trainer every year for the next 15 years. Yeah. Like, they were just, they just hired, like, crazy. And they just, like, doubled, you know, we're trying to fight against Zwift buying stuff it's crazy that no one there was like mm, this is a once in a lifetime pandemic and even if there's like a little bump we don't we need, we need to triple our staff in one year it's tricky because so many businesses like that made huge calls about how they thought things were going to be in nine 12 months from then and by mm. by the chance by the time they had the chance to capitalize on the you know the demand they were seeing the demand was already gone because there's like the lag in the production time of what you're doing so it's hard, like you've got to kind of look into the future and make a call on where you think things are going to be. So I guess a few businesses like that were kind of double screwed by the time that it came through. Have you guys seen, like, obviously that COVID cyclist peak was huge. Have you seen it still like a little rise? Like it can't, I'm assuming it can't have completely fallen off because, you know, a lot of people do fall in love with cycling once they get their bike. And even though there was a lot of people who were doing it because they had less options and they wanted to be outside, there's still going to be a, a fair amount who are, who are going to hold on. And even if they found cycling in COVID, they're going to kind of keep that love for it now that the world is back to normal. Have you seen kind of a, like, like at least a little bit sort of up from what, like prior to COVID? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. We were sort of in a growth phase regardless of that. And we're certainly still seeing there's a continuation. It's not at the same rate as it was before, but we're still, we're still seeing an uptake. But I think that the the issue hasn't it, it's it's been a combination of people being overstocked as well as a, a slight decline in the demand. So when when you're not dealing with the overstock issue, uh, it, you're in a much better position than someone who's got a ton of stock they need to clear. Definitely more cyclists, more more cycling customers in the market for sure. Like there's been a drop off, but I think the market is bigger than pre-COVID, like 2019. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like the average cyclist now, like post-COVID, is generally more style conscious than they would be pre-COVID. I feel like when I'm out riding, I see people with more attention to the kit they're wearing from a style perspective rather than just straight pragmatism. Does it fit and does it work? I don't know if anyone else has had that observation too, but I'm sure that helps you guys as well. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've sort of noticed it's kind of maybe a little bit what we were talking about um, with Ben C before recording was the sort of um, the double-edged sword of the ambassador, the influencer, and alongside, you know, people having to get out, you know, not being able to go to a lot of sort of gatherings during COVID, which is what I think lent to people being more active outside. It was, a, you know, they knew it was safe outside and that's what people were doing. 
also a lot of people are on their phones and their computers uh, when they were inside, when they were stuck. So I think that, you know, Insta uh, Instagram probably had a huge boom and, and people sort of seeing that. And, and, you know, once you get into something, especially the way the world has worked with the internet, you start to deep dive, right? So you, you buy a bike, you get into cycling, and then you start sort of searching things. And the more these influencers or ambassadors or brands come up on Instagram, the more you're sort of seeing what maybe you would like or what's popular. So I think it kind of went a little hand in hand, but, it, you know, I, it's certainly certainly uh, a lot less club kits. Yeah, definitely. Some of that's also trickling on from the COVID era where there wasn't as much racing or no racing, and then a lot of clubs weren't really able to do anything. There were no events, and they weren't ordering club kits and things like that. So, yeah, people reverted back to non-club for sure. The reason you're here is you guys got a new collaboration. So, and, and we're talking about style. And this might be, for me personally, this might be one of the ultimate. Because I think the first ever episode we did, a, when we were, still had time to do news before all our interviews, we talked about an Adidas, the Adidas released some stuff and I didn't love it. And I was saying how I really wish Kappa would make kit. Like I love Kappa. Warren and I grew up in an Eastern European neighborhood. So Kappa was abundant. Mm -hmm. yep. And then, so I always just wanted Kappa to make some kit. I'm on the record stating Attacker or Attaque is my favorite brand. And so when this collaboration dropped, when we were sent uh, the little bit of info, I thought this is even better than just Kappa making kit. This is, this is Kappa with my favorite cycling brand making kit. Now I do want to know, because, I, because you know I love you guys, and be, because I stated that I wanted Kappa to make kit, did anyone from Kappa or Attacker hear that on the podcast and how much influence did I have on this, this collaboration? We are happy to basically give you, attribute this whole collaboration to you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But in all, all seriousness, how did the collaboration come together? It's been in the works for a, a, uh, longer than what you would actually expect. So it came about six years. I had an, uh, an ex-work colleague who was working at Kappa and we, we had a loose conversation or two back in 2017, believe it or not. So we had some initial discussions and sort of floated a few ideas. It never really got off the ground. And then coincidentally, probably just over 12 months ago, another friend of mine, not the same ex-work colleague, started working at Kappa completely oblivious to the previous conversations we'd had in, in 2017 and hit me up and he's like, Hey, I'm working at Kappa. Let's have a chat. It'd be great to, to do something together. And I was like, yeah, did you realize we had this combo a few years back? And he was like, uh, no, what? And I'm like, Hey, look, we're happy to revisit it. Let's, let's, let's chat. And we had a few meetings and did some concepting and, and we went a lot deeper and put a lot more effort into it this time around. It, it got to the point where we were actually go time like we were, we were really into it and coincidentally like yeah ben ben can probably speak to it better than i can but there's a whole we just had the women's world cup in australia and it's been absolutely enormous it's been the biggest thing that's happened in the country since um the olympics back in 2000 and coincidentally there's this whole like bloke core thing happening this fashion vibe <laughs> with guys and girls everyone's into football jerseys at the moment so timing wise Having this collaboration happening between us and Kappa now is way better than what it would have been if we if we had done it back in 2017. So timing-wise, it's one of the rare instances where something falling through has worked in our favour. Like I think <laughs> we, you know, you go down many rabbit holes and many conversations and things don't eventuate and whatever. And then I think if we had launched it in 2017, in so many ways, it wouldn't nearly have had the impact or the market wouldn't have been ready. Whereas you look at it now and you've got so many leading fashion brands and Gucci, the, like the Gucci's of the world doing big football collaborations. And it feels like we've been working on this thing for 12, 18 months now so that it's just coincidentally dropping at exactly the right time. And we're all super high from the, like the FIFA Women's World Cup over here at the moment as well. So... <laughs> The, yeah, it's coincidental, the timing. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect. I'll, I'll admit, first off, I just want to make everybody be known. I am a Canadian. I'm going to call it soccer. You guys can call it football. Whoever can call it football. We obviously have Italian Alex and Universal Alex. You guys are Ben and Steve are calling it football, but I'm calling it soccer. That's fine. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I actually, since the Men's World Cup was, uh, you know, 
uh, in the in the winter time in Canada actually made it. I've I've started uh, playing soccer again since the first time since I was eight years old. Italian Alex and I are on a on a pickup team, so it's definitely the right time for cap. Although I mean, cap is an all the time thing for me. I took a look at the collection and it looks amazing. You guys have done some great kit. You've also done some off the bike stuff. But yep. I did notice no tracksuit. Are you worried about the backlash from Italian Americans? <laughs> we try. <laughs> yeah, they, it could it could be problematic for sure. But hopefully they'll they'll accept the the other pieces and 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 mix and match with their complete wardrobe of. Uh, I'm sure they've got multiple Kappa tracksuits with with snap buttons on the side already in their wardrobes that they can they can intermatch with our stuff. An attacker long sleeve tee with uh, snap off track pants. I can see Al Italian Alex. I know he has Kappa track pants. I have a full uh, Juventus Kappa tracksuit. Um, the pants are not tear away. They're like really shiny though, and it fits terribly. It's from like 1995. I bought it off Grailed, um, but I never wear the pants, just the jacket. But it does look great. Does Kappa tracksuit evoke more Italy or the Balkans to you, or Eastern Europe? It's ooh, it's a bit of both. Italy, it's a bit yeah. of both. Depends. It depends on whether you're wearing a sweatshirt and it's tucked into the track pant, or it's on. The <laughs> great, great point. Great distinguish. I think a strong look is also the tracksuit pants with an under jersey, like the, mm. the sleeveless undershirt. Like a singlet, you mean? Yeah, yeah, like a singlet with a with the chain over the top. Oh yeah, watering your sidewalk. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I don't know if they 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 do that there, but here, here, there's a certain group of uh, older gentlemen with, as you guys call it, thongs and socks with a Kappa tracksuit or you know singlet, gold chain, just water cleaning off their sidewalk all day. Back to the the history behind that collaboration. Initially, when I when I heard that you guys had collaborated with, with Kappa, the first thing that came to my mind, I started connecting some dots, and I thought, okay, Palace did something with Kappa, Palace did something with Cannondale and Rafa a little while ago. So, the the sort of Venn diagram of you know brands that weren't historically into cycling now getting into cycling, and then I wondered if you had been inspired by this Palace Kappa collaboration. But it seems like you were actually before that given that your initial discussions with Kappa started in 2017. Yeah, absolutely. Like we've been having this conversation a, a long time before the, the Palace Kappa, sorry, the Palace uh, Rafa collab came out. Like when we, were, when we were discussing how to take this to market, there's, there's, there's the old Seiko, Cannondale, Cipollini angle that we could have, could have taken with that heritage of cycling. And Kappa does have obviously a history in cycling. Um, and they sponsored some teams and, and made kit back in the day. But we wanted to approach it differently and do something that was less obvious. And so we, we went down this rad ball route. We were, we were trying to talk about how do, how do we merge the two things with, with football and cycling as opposed to just going down that heritage route. Is Radball real? Because I, and forgive that my ignorance and lack of Googling, but in the media release, it, it talked about Radball as like combining soccer and cycling, like, and that's like the answer to a question no no one ever asked. So it it is a it is a real sport. So UCI, it's it's got two names. Like I think uh, it's called it's called Cycle Ball or or Radball. Um, okay. It's actually been around since 1863 or something along those lines it's a uci sport it has a world championships i think its origins are in germany i think that's that's where it started but it's a very niche sport <laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't kind of get the credit or, or notoriety that it deserves because it's probably a very very difficult sport to play like you, you look at the skill level that these dudes um, require there's also a tongue-in-cheek element to it as well like not going down that obvious route of, of the heritage of cycling but championing something like rad ball or cycle ball is where we wanted to wanted to take things it's just a, a bit a lot more unexpected yeah you can see in some of the the collateral that we sent you over where we're heroing there's these two brothers from czechoslovakia they've actually won 20 world championship titles in cycle ball which is a huge, a huge feat in any sport, winning 20 world championships. Yeah. We, we wanted to have some fun with it. 
and and do something really outside the box. So, so back to Alex's question for me, Kappa Algo is is Balkan Eastern Europe. Like again, Warren and I grew up in like a Ukrainian Polish neighborhood. Every kid had like, well, not us. We're not that, but every other kid had like a Kappa tracksuit. So bulky Eastern European men. Going back to the subject of this interview as the Tony's uh, obsession with uh, watering sidewalks. Why do you think we haven't seen more soccer and cycling brands collab? Because Italian Alex actually pointed out that a few years back, you did a, a kit that was uh, Juventus inspired, I think, like a black and white striped jersey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've we've always kind of dabbled uh, here and there. We've done a few of those football retro patterns in in jersey here and in jerseys here and there. It's it's kind of weird that cycling and football, you you it's almost you're either one or the other. You can't be both. You can I guess have an interest in one, but you're a real fanatic about the other. They don't seem to overlap all that much, like especially in parts. Europe. I feel like somewhere in Belgium, right, where we've got football and cycling competing for national sports status. It feels like you have a passing interest in one, but you probably die hard about the other. But I mean, in somewhere like Australia, that's both of them or neither of them are mainstream sports. Football is kind of heading that way, but they're both like second tier sports to a lot of the other uh, football codes that we have. I was going to say that, I don't think I wrote that down, the questions, but I was going to ask that, because the same in Canada, right, where there's sort of these Euro sports as big as soccer is in uh, the world in terms of a, a sport in Canada. Um, it's, you're, it's a second tier. It's not, it's gaining popularity, but it's sort of not quite there. But both sort of the main sports in our countries, respectively, Canada and Australia, are very tough sports. Hockey, rugby, Aussie rules. Soccer is a little bit softer, and some might say there's a lot of diving. Does that bother you at all? Is like a hardened Australia, it's Australian? It doesn't. It doesn't bother me personally. But like we're just coming off of the back of the World Women's World Cup, there was there was actually a lot of talk about that in the commentary about how women don't dive; they just get on with it, and they're tougher than the men. And kind of true in a lot of ways, I guess you could you could say there's. There's maybe less of the theatrics to draw fouls in the in the women's game. Look, it doesn't it doesn't personally offend me that it's considered less tough or anything like that. I don't know. I mean, I think I have my personal opinion. I think the reason why there the Venn diagram of people who are into soccer and people who are into cycling that that intersection really isn't there. That they're kind of mutually exclusive. I don't think it has to do with soccer. I think it has more to do with cycling. That most cycling aficionados or kind of misfits who don't really fit into anything else or who, you know, cycling just takes so much time. And I realize it as a, as a dad as well. Now that I have a three-year-old and I'm expecting another one in the fall, it is difficult to find the time to truly devote to cycling and people who are into cycling just can't be into a lot of other stuff overall. So that's, that's my theory as to why the soccer cycling intersection doesn't really happen. I'm glad you actually brought up soccer and cycling intersections because when i first got into cycling i came into it as someone who played soccer before and since they're both european sports i just kind of assumed that everyone that was into cycling in canada would be into soccer as well because they both have that shared geographic origin so when i first started riding i thought oh boy this is awesome i'm sure a lot of these people watch soccer are familiar with it and follow along and i found that like basically none of the people that we ride with are into soccer like at all i'm like in our extended social group i might be one of the few but i think that the reason in canada anyway um that there isn't so much of a connection there between the two sports is that and this is my observation here anyway is that cycling is a bit of an expensive sport and there's a very high barrier of entry associated with cost on the flip side with soccer I mean, there's basically no barrier of entry. You just need your cleats and not even cleats, a ball and, and an open area to play in. And so the target demographics for each where we live is pretty different. And I think it just makes it appeal to different audiences here. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that too. Yeah. yeah. With this collection, are you hoping to reach fans of both? I think cyclists, I mean, personally, like, 
I'm aware of the brand Kappa, but I, you know, I, I don't know it as well as somebody like Tony, but I still see this kid. And I'm like, oh, that's like, I'd wear that in a heart- heartbeat. Are you hoping to reach like both cyclists and like soccer fans? Because it you also have those like off bike pieces. Is that sort of the idea? Yeah, definitely. I think this for us is a good opportunity to get in front of people that maybe wouldn't be purely interested in attack or cycling. Maybe they've got a slight interest in cycling, but having it with Kappa is enough to sort of bring them a little bit more into our space. So for sure, I think we're, we're trying to appeal to people that are into football, but even outside of that, like at the moment, I think there's people that are into the fashion of football and they're not mm-hmm. necessarily into the sport of football itself. Um, so that's like yeah. another group of people that I think Will potentially take notice of this and what we're creating at the moment as well. Are you worried about the secondary market? Just StockX going crazy with one thousand dollar long sleeve t shirts. <laughs> it's a dream. <laughs> it's good for them. Well, no, they don't see anybody from it. Yeah. But I guess it gives them high it Gives them that. Gives it, them, gives them, them, it gives them prestige. Yeah, it's that supreme buying a supreme brick. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll save a couple of pieces and then throw them up on stock X later on. Down. <laughs> Over- maybe that's the, maybe that's the future for the cycling market in a world of growing stockpiles of unsold uh, goods from COVID. Maybe now we go to very, very limited edition releases, you know, the Rolex model, not supplying enough to the market and, and allowing the second, the secondary market to just go crazy. Yeah, we could yeah. just do a Kanye and we could just burn burn 90% of the stock, oh, just order it and burn 90%. I think they're reselling it again. It's oh. back on the market, the Yeezy. Speaking of people who are in the uh, into the soccer fashion and going back to not only this collection with Kappa, but that uh, Juventus-inspired uh, kit from a few years ago, is there something that cycling kit brands, whether it's you or other, or other brands, could take as inspiration from like soccer jersey designs. And again, I'm asking this as somebody who knows extremely little about soccer, Euro football. So, but I am curious because, you know, occasionally I'll see soccer uniforms and, uh, you know, logos aside, don't think they look that bad, but just curious uh, your thoughts on that. I think that um, there's a handful of brands that probably have kind of gone through an archive of old football jersey patterns and and sort of tweaked them and, and reused them here and there. And I think it's something that occasionally I've seen on race teams as well. They've used some inspiration from old football jerseys and that's probably where that would ease, more easily exist as opposed to a brand trying to, to repurpose or take inspiration from football jerseys. Yeah. But I've, I've, I've sort of seen a, a hint of it here and there around the place, but I don't think anyone's run with it as their as their whole concept for, for brand or anything like that. But it's, it's interesting seeing some pro teams like having a home and away jersey. Like within cycling, they have alternate jerseys and alternate colours, which I think is maybe something that's a lot more prevalent in football, like the home and away jersey, so there's no clash. Like some of the teams that, I don't know, in the... In the Giro, if their jersey has too much pink in it, or in the Tour, if it has too much yellow, like they'll have to wear an alternate stripe because it competes with the, the leader jersey. Yeah, I love that idea. But remember what Yumbo Visma did last year or two oh, years ago God. with the the masterpiece jersey? That was that wasn't worth it. That wasn't worth that, was that wasn't worth us seeing a, an alternate jersey. <laughs> the poop jersey. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea. I mean, I've actually, I don't know, I've I've always sort of. I know it's a very people have called it like a very American way to do it, and the um, the Legion guys do it. But I've always kind of liked the idea of like a name or number on the kit, like for the pros, because sometimes like we 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 have coming up the 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 GP Montreal in a couple of weeks, um, and you know we're there, VIPs standing by the side of the road. And sometimes you see, you know you're looking for the you're looking for the stars, and except for Wout's Red Bull helmet. Sometimes teammates look very similar. You think, oh, is that Todd Edge? And then you realize it's not. It's just another tall, thin guy. And so I kind of wish they would have that so I can like point them out a little bit better. But I don't know. I've heard some criticism. It's too American. What's your take on that? Did you, did you guys hear that 
Kevin Durant, basketball player, bought into. They're setting up a league in the US. Yeah. Like national the cycle. NCL, the National Crit League. Yeah, he invested in it. Is that an existing league or are they creating their own league? Uh, no, it's new this year. It's a whole, almost, I would say, boondoggle that in that they started off with, I think, five races scheduled and now they're down to three. And I think Kevin Durant was like part of the group of investors that sort of gave them a boost of cash midway through the year because it's already happening. And I think they're struggling with awareness, to be honest. Like even there's a lot of cyclists out there who don't even know what's happening. And it, the last race was on GCN Plus, for example. Oh um God. So yeah, I've heard of that. You know, there's uh, I think there's a, a couple podcasts out there that have covered it better than me trying to remember what's happening. I'll give them credit. They're trying something a bit different. Like it's crits, but I don't know. There's some weird scoring system that I don't understand. Do they have names and numbers on the jerseys? I haven't, I haven't seen it. I don't know, actually. Um, I don't think so. I think Legion is racing in that. And I... I know they've done it a few times, but I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't watched it, but yeah, I think the number and I agree with Tony when we were at GP Montreal last year, like Wout is just gigantic and the red, like relatively for a cyclist. Uh, and then Pagachar is pretty small for a cyclist. And those are like the only two I could really recognize in this whole sea of people. So I think it'd be, it's not a bad idea, you know, like God forbid uh, people know who they're cheering for and that kind of thing. I think it's a good idea. I think it makes it any way to mix up the format and how they're doing it to make it more interesting or for it. Yeah, like I, I think so as it. well. Like when you, like if you, it's not, it's not the best comparison, but when you look at the F1 series on Netflix and what that did for F1 versus the Unchained doco series on Netflix, like different, very different sports, but in F1, you know who the heroes and the villains are and it, it really champions the story of each of the the individual races. Whereas on, on Unchained, it is a lot harder to identify who's who in the peloton. And there was a way to better champion those personalities of the riders and call them out in the race so you know who you're looking at and who's doing what. I think it would certainly have a positive impact on yeah viewership. I think stars drive sports. I mean, I don't know... Uh, you know, I know down in Australia, you've got the AFL and, and the the rugby league, and I'm sure you have your own sort of stars within that. But in terms of North American sports, we obviously, you know, Toronto shares our sports mostly with the American leagues, which are becoming international. And really, you know, stuff like basketball, which is blown up all over the place. It's, it's, I mean, it's a great sport, but it's driven by the fact that they market their stars very heavily, right? Yeah. Curry, LeBron, all those guys. And I think that's how, like, if you're not necessarily like 100% into the action of the sport, where you're, you know, the details of the sport, you, I don't want to say a bandwagoner, but you want to kind of get to know the personalities. And you're right, that's kind of the F1 thing. When you talk to people who have sort of recently gone to F1, it's always about like a person they saw, like one of the drivers they yeah. saw and just sort of fell in love with. And I think cycling's done a really bad job of promoting that just in general. And I mean, I know it's a team sport and, they want it to be more that, you know, even guys like Cav, who are some of the biggest stars, he wants to show that his team helped out. But from a marketing perspective, it's just kind of weak. But I think that's what we can, you know, commend Attacker for is by collabing with Kappa, they're bringing that mainstream recognition through like a universally recognizable brand that is Kappa into cycling, which is a very niche sport, right? Finally, we can get a collaboration that's between universally cherished brand like kappa and a cycling brand like attacker thanks alex <laughs> <laughs> I, I think alex makes a good point though because like you know you have your, your palace collabs and personally i view palace as sort of like a, a hype beast brand whereas kappa to tony's point it's been around for ages i've known about it since i grew up it, it's got a much richer history so not only are you bring that in so i think you're naturally going to bring new eyes to cycling and, and that kind of thing. But it makes me wonder, like, what does it take to, what do you think it takes to get outsider non-cycling brands like Kappa or currently non-cycling uh, brand like Kappa interested in doing collabs like this? Because I don't know, maybe cycling's too weird. I, I, I'm not sure, but what do you think 
appeals to a, a brand like Kappa to do uh, a collab on cycling kit with uh, with yourselves? Kappa's an, an interesting one because I guess a lot of the a lot of the time when collaborations aren't particularly common within the cycling space to begin with, so you've got a limited sort of option most people are fairly literal when it comes to cycling and they're like a cycling brand should only align with another cycling brand it's got to be a, a, a bike with apparel or a component with this or whatever it all sort of needs to same stay within the same family so mm -hmm. when you're talking to brands that aren't from within cycling and don't necessarily understand the sport or don't have a history with it it's very difficult to explain to them what cycling is about, who the audience is and, and what you're trying to achieve from it. Kappa, on the other hand, does have a history with cycling. They've sponsored teams before. They're Italian. They've, I think they've even sponsored the Milan San Remo or, or had some work with them. But they, they kind of get it. So they do have that bit of history. It's a little bit easier with them. But Often, if you're talking to someone from outside of cycling or another brand from outside of cycling, it's more about who you know rather than what you know. It's, it really comes down to having a personal connection with someone. And sure. um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite challenging to, to actually make these things come off. It will be interesting, though, that now there's been sort of a few of them by some of the bigger players in in the sport and the industry, like whether that paves the way for more of these in the future, like whether some brands, uh, more mainstream brands that are a little more risk averse because they can see the success of how it's worked before, maybe then they'll have more of an appetite for doing it because it doesn't seem as, as risky. Under Armour. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a great one. That'd be awful. Um, I've looked. We've 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 perused the uh, media guide and taken a look at the collection, and somehow it's both distinctly attacker and distinctly Kappa. And yeah, Kappa is obviously we talk about history. They do have a history in cycling, but most people think of them from football or soccer or Eastern Europeans watering sidewalks. Uh, <laughs> uh, how hard was it to actually do the collaboration where you were sort of melding your two companies or two brands and making it so you look at it and you know it's a kappa collab it has kappa's kind of essence but especially attacker which has kind of a other i mean you guys have done so much great stuff that, that that spans a lot but still there's a there's an attacker vibe like how to make it so you really see it and you're like that's a kappa jersey but also an attacker jersey very evenly but also very prominently it's i i know i'm probably being like you know it probably doesn't make any sense to a lot of people, but that's how I felt when I saw it. That's kind of the fun side of the collab is like bringing it to life and experimenting with the logos and the branding and looking at some of their history and bringing it in and uh, looking at some of our history and bringing it in and then working out where the two meet. And that's, that's what we kind of kept asking ourselves at the beginning of it. And that's that question that Warren was saying is, is, what we asked ourselves like where does cycling and football merge and we we didn't want to look at kappa from the, their cycling history we wanted to look at it from their football history so it was very much where does cycling and football merge and and one of our colleagues ryan um was like oh rad ball we've got let, let's try this rad ball concept and then we we fleshed that out we had a lot of laughs so don't, don't get me wrong we, we we take it serious but we were actually kind of laughing about the how the two merge because it's a little bit nonsensical in in some ways we, we we had fun with it for sure and then once you once you have that approach or that angle that you want to go down things things sort of fall into place you 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 you, you have a bit of fun with the logo like where we merge the the um the kappa omni logo with the attacker logo this one half is a skeleton and one half is a is a human form brilliant um, i love it yeah nailed it yeah and then yeah, it all it all kind of falls into place from there fairly organically. We didn't want it to feel like I feel like there's some collabs that are, you know, they borrow each other's brand name and then they just slap a logo on something that already exists anyway. Like that's the last thing we wanted to do. Like we didn't think that would bring any value or any interest to anyone. So we wanted to feel like it's a proper, unique piece that we've created for these collabs you know how does that change your production run like are you making sure obviously it is a limited edition product but 
you know, how much different is that sort of the process of choosing, I guess, obviously the stuff you have that's kind of consistent, but you know, how do you choose how much you make? Is it, do you have sort of sales projections, hopes, or just, do you want to be super limited and don't mind that it sells out quick or how does that kind of work? It's all of that. Like all of that is taken in consideration. We have like a bunch of meetings and discussions and plans around what we think it could be. How will it be received by the market? Will they get it? Will they, will they like it? You, and you're trying to strike a balance between you want to keep it somewhat limited, but no, you, you don't want to make it ridiculous because that actually kind of pisses people off as well. They're like, oh, it sold out in one minute. What the hell was the point of all that? And you, you go to a lot of effort to, to create this collateral and create the story and make it something genuine. So you don't want it to disappear immediately as well. So it's you're trying to strike a balance between all of those things that you mentioned. Well, why don't we move on to uh, everyone's favorite part of the interview? Well, that's probably not true because you guys have said a lot of great things throughout the like main part, but the rapid fire is always fun. Uh, so let's go on to the rapid fire. You've already done it once. So a lot of those standard questions that we ask will not be on this because people should be going back and listening to the first attacker episode if they want the answers to that. And we'll put a link to that uh, in the in the show notes, of course, as well. Well, Warren will. I don't know what the show notes do. Um, all right. So <laughs> rapid fire. Favorite, uh, again, I'm calling it soccer, but you guys can call it football. Favorite soccer league? APL. Yeah, I'm English Premier League as well. Favorite team? Matildas. Oh, oh. I, uh, got in there. It's a touchy subject for us because the Canadian team did so poorly. Like, and there were such expectations for it, and they did like knocked out in the in the group, group stage. stage. I think by the Matildas, like brutally beaten. Right? It was like five nothing or something. I wasn't going to bring it up, but yeah, mm. I'll, I'll I'll go with EPL. And favorite team for me is Liverpool. Oh, we know your favorite team, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be. It's the best kit. What's the best kit around the whole world? National teams, you know, all the leagues. What's the best kit in soccer? Oh, I like I like the retro ones. Like I, I really like some of the old Liverpool jerseys, like the '90s ones, where they were sponsored by Candy, and where Arsenal was sponsored by JVC. They had nice patterns and uh, nice colorways and stuff like that. I like some of the stuff Venezia is doing with. Uh... Kappa right now. They've got some pretty cool jerseys that started off as the inspiration for what we were doing. But either that or just the classic Argentina, the white and blue stripes. Yeah, I was going to actually ask, it's good you brought that up because when I looked at the Kappa attacker collab, it was the same color scheme as Venezia. I guess that is where you drew the inspo from, like the the orange, black, and green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. Excellent. That's why we have Italian Alex on for actual soccer knowledge. There you go. <laughs> but but the Venezia kit is almost more of a fashion thing than a soccer thing at this point. Like it is very nice what they've done, and that's a that's a city B uh, club, right, Alex? Or it's not even it's not even ah. Yeah, now they're city B. They got relegated, but they were last year. They were in there for for one season. They made it up and then went right back down. Super fashionable though, like they did all the photo oh, yeah. shoots on the gondolas in Venice in the canals with top models and stuff like that. Throw that in the canal. Hey, oh. <laughs> all right, we know that your favorite Australian, uh, well, team in general is Matilda's, meaning the women's Australian team. But the name of the national men's team is the Socceroos, and is that the best team name for an international team? I can't think of any better ones. So by default, that's got to be the yeah. best one. Yeah. What, what's the Canadian national team called? The uh, men, they even men's have Canadian name? national Rouge. team. I was going to say the Canadian national team. <laughs> yeah. What is it, Alex, you, you said? I believe, I mean, you can say it better than me, but I believe it's Le Rouge. Le Rouge. Le Rouge. It's just the red. The reds. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're red. But I don't know. I think Soccer Rouge is one of the most clever Clever names of any sport. Just absolutely hilarious. Soccer beavers would be Canada. <laughs> the beaver. Maybe we could start a petition and, and rename the Canadian soccer team to like the Moose Knuckles or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a hockey inspiration. Uh, there, probably is, there probably is There probably is a minor hockey league team called the Moose Knuckles. Oh, actually. 100%. I'm sure. Yeah, almost guaranteed. 
But the Canadian uh, the Canadian championship title is called the Voyageur Cup. The Voyageur being the um, like the, the explorers in the woods, like catching beavers yeah. and stuff like that. I thought that was pretty cool. But it definitely yeah. has to reference the cold because that's like our that's like our chance. Like when during the during the World Cup qualifying, I, I Canada was doing well, sort of all you know within the region. But there was a couple games I think that were played in Edmonton in like February or something, and they were like it was like Uruguay came and it's like minus twenty five and like eight feet of snow, and Canada just destroyed them because they're just that's like we need we need a, like a winter World Cup in Canada for us to have a chance to get past. Well, they they upset they upset Mexico in Edmonton exactly that in february when there was oh, yeah, like sorry, five feet of snow mexico. outside and you know mexico plays their their home games at the azteca stadium in mexico city and so they renamed the edmonton stadium the ice Azteca, uh, uh, yeah. as a, a nod to the famous uh, azteca on games all right so sp- uh, final rapid fire question speaking of uh, international play i feel like you're going to answer this the world cup women's or men's or the euro cup Oh, Women's World Cup. We just experienced it firsthand. It's been World Cup. unbelievable. Like the way it, I, I don't know what it was like experiencing over there in, the, in a different time zone, but here we were selling out every match, every stadium, like 80,000 people. It was, it was wild. Like it was, it was really good. It, best thing since, since we had the Olympics in 2000, I can't, yeah, I can't tell you how big it was. Everyone was watching it either at the pub or at, um, at home or in the stadiums, if you could get tickets, it was excellent. It was so good. Yeah. I tell you about propelling a sport into mainstream consciousness. That was massive here for that. I mean, it's great. You guys had a, a good turn up. But as you asked, what was it like with the bad times? It was terrible. Uh, way too hard to watch. Games were way too early in the morning. And yeah. they shouldn't allow Australia to have any international competitions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not a big enough market to have that time zone uh, ruin it for American, for North Americans and Euro- even Europeans. So um, it's great. Like, yeah, I saw the numbers. It's amazing that uh, the women's soccer was able to do that. But uh, it didn't make it easy for us. Um, so I'm putting it, love Australia, but official ban on Australia getting international competitions. <laughs> If it's any consolation, Tony, the next Men's World Cup is going to be hosted right here at home. So you can come over to my house. We can pre-drink and we can walk to BMO Stadium to watch some of the group stage matches. Great. Does that mean Canada automatically makes it? Yes. Beautiful. We're a host nation. Beautiful. Right. Moose knuckle. Great. Automatic qualification. <laughs> For the moose knuckle. <laughs> we're going to get this going. We'll, we'll make, make us some stuff. Um, all right. You guys, you guys are fans of the podcast. I know your fans. So uh, you got any, any canals or chameleon to finish us off? I think I might have to pull the white bibs out of the canal from last time. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. That didn't age well. I mean, Mathieu, Mathieu Van Der Poel just had a masterful display of white bibs with world champ jersey. I know. I'm pulling them out of the canal. So for the first time, I'm, I'm diving into the canal and pulling something out. They could be a little bit soiled if you're wearing them straight out of the canal. <laughs> Might not be white anymore. I I, I, hadn't, I don't even remember what I threw in the canal last time. I can't. You can't were remember. talking about over kidding, over kid. No, people going out in freezing cold in just bibs and jerseys. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Let, let's throw the, the the moose knuckle into the canal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think. Uh, I mean, this was definitely one of my better interviews. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> setting up this collaboration between us and Kappa, Tony. We full credit to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm inspirational in the industry. People reach out. Uh, people want uh, you want to talk to me about things. So, uh, no, having you guys back on was amazing. I'll reiterate, you guys are my favorite brand. I tell everyone about you that hasn't heard. Um, you know, you guys keep talking that you're small, and I hope to make help make you bigger. Uh, the stuff you release, but I just want to say for those newer listeners, when I'm talking about that, it's not just the the style they release, but the, it's the best fitting kit I've ever had. Uh, it's stretchy over my uh, not uh, small body, and uh, I love it. And we're really happy that you guys came back. And for me, Kappa finally being back in the kit brand, especially was mixed with you guys, is is a huge W, big W. So thanks again. Thanks for having us, guys, and hopefully. Uh... We'll do this again soon in person and go for a ride somewhere one of these days, not just a virtual chat. 
Maybe we need like a cycling fashion week uh, meetup in somewhere like middle uh, between Australia. Well, like the direct middle would probably be the ocean, but like, you know, a European place or something like that. Let's choose a, an influencer hotspot where we can, <laughs> there might be, we'll go, we'll go to an influencer hotspot and uh, get Warren to buy one. Morocco. Well, now that Warren owns a standard, he's just he's he's actually he's actually been uh, looking at places in Girona. Yeah. Now that he bought a standard, yeah. so uh, buy one up. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to add to what Tony said. Um, I wanted to clarify something: is attacker kit also fits well on my slim body as well as Tony's less slim body? Uh, so I would <laughs> echo that and be sure to follow them on Instagram and check out this uh, collaboration with Kappa because. I'm certainly a fan and I don't know anything about soccer. Attacker is the sisterhood of the traveling pants of a uh, cycling kit. What? Do I, do I need to explain that? You never saw the sisterhood oh, yeah. of the fits traveling anybody, pants. I got it. Yeah. It's yeah, every, sorry. fits all right. the friends, yeah, even right. though they're very different body friends. types. Got it. Right. I forgot. Also shout out Warren bragging that he has a slim body. <laughs> <laughs> lean. He's during, He's getting his. He's lean. He's getting his during rider time. Lean. Oh god! Remember, remember, he got famous off that that like YouTube video where he just kept saying he was lean. He dropped into our DMs and we deleted that message ASAP. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the, uh, the the podcast again. I'm sure we'll have you again in the future when you do another interesting something around open invitation open invitation guys you just message us anything if you just want to talk about stuff even if it's non-cycling related we'll have like an episode ben steve from attacker talks about um gardening we'll catch up and we'll talk about watering our front pavement next time yeah <laughs> all awesome. right thanks so much guys nice. thanks for having us guys. hey what are you doing I don't know, I'm just fucking tossing bites in the river, bro. Okay, for our next segment, it is the return of Into the Canal, the segment where we throw something from the world of cycling that we don't like in, I was going to say Venice's Grand Canal, but no, into Montreal's La Chine Canal. Throwing it in the Venice Canal would be more of a compliment. Uh, or alternatively, we can have a camélien for something that we want to commend from the world of cycling. So, guys, what do you have into the canal this week? Warren wants to go. Yeah, I, I feel like this one is been sitting in my mind for a while, and I've just seen more people do it recently. So I finally got to canal it. I am canaling, titling your Strava ride noodle, and having an average speed of 30 kilometers an hour. If you're doing a true noodle, you're probably doing 26, 25, maybe. I don't even know, because if I'm doing a noodle, I don't pay attention to what my speed is, but if you're averaging 30K an hour, you are definitely putting in more than a noodle effort. You're not that strong. You are a strong cyclist, but you're not so strong that you can noodle 30K an hour in Toronto. Like maybe out in the country with a tailwind, get it i i just don't get first of all i don't even get titling your strava ride noodle personally like do you have to say oh this is a noodle to prove that you go fast at other times or something like it's just a bit it's just a bike ride uh but to purposefully go out of your way to title your ride noodle and then average 30k an hour that is 100 percent canal behavior because you are trying to send a message with that in my opinion and i've noticed it happening a lot and yes yeah, some of these cyclists are very strong cyclists but you're not you know we're not world tour pros here you know we're not this isn't the rest day of uh the tour de france don't call a ride that isn't a noodle a noodle uh or actually do a noodle because it probably would be good for you and for your health you need to take a break i normally don't look at people's stats but if i see a ride that says noodle i now check to see <laughs> Uh, what their speed was to see if it was actually a noodle or not. Warren has Strava police. I don't know if people know this or not, but I don't use Strava. <laughs> I don't think I've mentioned it before. Um, no, never. But Warren, I thought I thought we threw average speed into the canal. Are you looking at their power data? If they have a power meter, of course. If it's possible that they average 30 with an average of 130 watts, That's are you okay with that? That's not possible in Toronto. <laughs> no, you're right. Not, it's not. The noodle is basically the average influencer ride where... They're in a huge bunch of 25 people just hiding in the middle. 
And yeah, they are going 32 kilometers an hour. They're just not putting in very much effort other than for the five pictures that they have someone take of them during the ride. My point is in the city of Toronto, you can't do a noodle ride and go that fast. I don't care what your power is. Yeah, with stop signs and red lights. Yeah, let me share a secret with everyone. If you want to really flex on everyone on Strava with your ride titles, the real secret is to not name any of your Strava rides ever and just leave them all as like morning ride or lunch ride or afternoon ride. Don't name them because if you don't name them, it shows everyone you don't care. And as we all know, not caring is probably the coolest thing you can do. Yeah, but you don't name your rides, but you code you kudos every single ride. Oh yeah, I'm on immediately. I'm I get home, I sit on the can, and I just like start firing away with kudos. I am so indiscriminate. It doesn't matter. You know, you can just shake the phone, right? At least for like the full ride for the group. Yeah, you could yeah. shake your phone just to kudos everybody. I think Tony and I have cracked the code. The coolest thing is not being on Strava. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're just, probably right. Just forgetting about it. I, I should show screenshots from Anthony like this like this ride on Strava because I still get kudos from Tony. No, I take a look at it or whatever. I want to see people are up to. Cause I, cause at, He's a lurker. Uh, well, Italian Alex leaves us out of a lot of rides. He has very exclusive um, other people rides. And so sometimes I, I see, I, I start off and I see the Instagram posts of him on some beautiful morning ride or having a coffee with friends that aren't us. And so then I want to lurk and like see what the ride was, see who was on it, why we weren't invited you know what what what's the exclusive you know the exclusive nature he invites me well, okay well <laughs> no i know it's cuz he knows i'm busy but i don't have fomo in general in my life but uh, cycling sometimes i get fomo so late august this is the return of an annual tradition for me i think it is probably i'm going to say the third edition of this annual tradition and i am going to canal the Vuelta a España, the absolute worst, worst grand tour out there. Maybe a, a cycling event that doesn't need to happen at this point. Where should I start? And again, for those uh, committed fans of the podcast, you know that this is an annual occurrence. So some of those arguments may have been made in, in previous years. But the Vuelta, not not a very interesting grand tour. I think we're all a bit burnt out from the from the cycling season we we don't have that that level of excitement that we have when the spring classics roll around we've watched a lot of racing we're not all that interested the red jersey doesn't have a very strong identity used to be the golden jersey i think it was even orange at some point now it's red for some reason kind of ugly doesn't really doesn't really make uh, make a very strong impression the landscapes in Spain that you see, just a lot of really dry, kind of boring to look at terrain, you know, unlike the the Giro or the Tour de France where you have kind of nicer looking landscapes. I was looking at the route this year. Interestingly, they've put a lot of stuff in the on the northern coast of Spain, which is a little bit greener. Um, I guess, you know, the, the influencers out in, in Girona or, or Mallorca are, are, are going to send me some hate mail, given that they're, they love Spain. But yeah, just maybe not as interesting to watch overall. So uh, another reason why I would canal the Vuelta a España is because it's the ultimate opportunity to hear British people say things like Ibiza or Barcelona, which is supremely annoying. So yeah, Vuelta a España in, in the canal. I want to say to our listeners, we're recording this a few days before the Vuelta starts, and I think this is going to air in the mid-Vuelta. I generally agree with your canal, Alex. I more or less and still watch it, but I, th- I I'm, oh I'll, I'll watch it for I'm sure. Yeah. That, well, this year especially, <laughs> you got Remco, you got Vinigo. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Uh, and and uh, Primos, uh, who I love the idea that Yumbo is saying uh, Primos and Vingo are are co leaders. It's like yeah, right. But anyway, I I think this year, you know, maybe though, like Remco's support team with Quickstep is such dog shit that it might not be much of a race. <laughs> So yeah, actually, you know what? You're you're right. It's it's in the canal because Vingugo is probably going to run away with this thing. And I'm going to do this canal again exactly in a year from now. For me, this like every time you mention the switching of the jersey, like that because the Grand Tour is also feel this like monumental in its heritage and its history, right? Because you know, obviously, they're great races and and they put to, you know 
put together great roots, but part of it's that just years and years and years. The the pink jersey and the yellow jersey just matter so much. And then when you've got this race and they're just like switching up jerseys constantly, an ochre jersey, a red jersey, like who knows what else they'll do later. It just, yeah, it doesn't feel, it doesn't have the same feeling as the, the Giro and the Tour. But what if there was a Vuelta Unchained? Unchained, brought to you by SRAM. <laughs> 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 okay um italian alex what do you got in the canal this week all right for my canal i've been holding on to this one for a little while um and i feel like we're definitely beating a dead horse on this podcast with this one but i have to say something about it those are the easiest horses to beat. i know that's and that's why i have to go back you know because it's it obviously works it's our our numbers have been growing steadily and we just keep saying the same thing every week so obviously people love to hear it i have to canal the new men's mechanism late drop connection from pad or mal studios i really think that they phoned this collection in if you guys haven't seen it yet it's typical panormal mechanism release what distinguishes this one it just makes me so upset to see it is is that they've opted for this collection to go for a monogram pattern with their logos on top of the kit and with their logos which are aesthetically very beautiful i actually am a panormal fan i do like their kit and earlier in the year if, if our listeners that are astute remember i spoke very highly and i gave a comien to the solitude collection which preceded this one which is one of my favorite releases of the year to go from that one to this is just such a disappointment to me it's it they really phoned it in it the the logos they have do not work with a monogram if you're designing a monogram and you think of like iconic monograms in the design world and the fashion world they have very stylized features that make them respond well to being repeated over uh, a piece of fabric or a canvas or, or something like that. These sans serif logos do not respond well to being placed over the entirety of a jersey. And what you're left looking at is something that looks like mid-century modern pajamas. Like, I can't <laughs> imagine a scenario where this looks good. And they've tried their best with their marketing and PR to make it look great. But if when a jersey is just so ugly all the photography and styling and curation in the world just can't redeem that. And not only that, but the colors they went with don't even work well. All this to say, I'm just so disappointed with this collection. They really didn't put much effort into this. And I am canaling the men's mechanism, quote unquote, late drop. What first came up, I guess, in my mind when I saw this collection was that it looked like pharmaceutical packaging or, <laughs> you know, the packaging that you would put on, yeah, just pharmaceutical products. There's a description of what the drugs are. There's a warning on it. It says if it can be used in the European Union or in North America, etc. And also maybe like design the design version of lorem ipsum so to speak like a watermark that you would put there temporarily before you do something else but they just kind of left it there after so i agree with you alex it, it feels like unfinished business or something that they kind of half half did and just uh yeah just did a half-assed job on it all right uh, you guys are all very negative so i'm gonna give a chameleon i'm gonna give a chameleon to gcn t-shirts <laughs> Whoa, hot take. <laughs> no way. This is from left field. Not the actual Unexpected. aesthetic. Not the actual aesthetic of the t-shirts. They're terrible and I wouldn't wear it. would be caught dead wearing one. Uh but I was at a cottage a little while ago, uh, and it was a rented cottage, so I didn't know the area. An area I hadn't been to, and I was out with the family at the sort of local beach taking for a swim. And I saw a gentleman in a GCN t-shirt. That sort of gave me the understanding, like GCN for all its faults uh you know people who watch uh watch it and and obviously buy t-shirts are usually sort of committed cyclists probably not a lot of like crossover with our market certainly people into it and so i went up to him and you know asked if he had a cottage around the area he did and uh, i was looking for some roots again i didn't know kind of anything about it i don't know if i've told people but i don't use strava so i didn't do the hot mat hot heat maps or anything 
so anyways, he gave me some, I told him where I was staying and he gave me some routes and I ended up on some, uh, you know, incredible sort of gravel roads up and down in the, you know, east, sort of uh, just east of Toronto. And uh, yeah, if it wasn't for the GCN t-shirt in uh, all its glory, I, I mean, I'm sure I would have sort of putted around and, and hopefully figure something out, but I wouldn't have got the, the great, uh, the great gravel route that I ended up having. I think the average GCN t-shirt enjoyer is probably one of the nicest people you can find in the world. Like if you wear, someone wears a GCN t-shirt, you know they're a nice person. And that is because GCN are just so helpful with their videos on how to maintain your bike or how to change whatever part on, on your bicycle. And so I think it, it translates over. They're, they're always very cheery. They're always very happy. And, and I feel like GCN kind of, um, yeah, encourages this sort of positivity and, and helpfulness. So someone wearing a GCN t-shirt, definitely a sign that they're a good person. One thing with the GCN shirts is everyone seems to be wearing a boy's small. <laughs> like, yeah, they're always really Like small. we talk about bloke core, everyone's wearing very small versions. Like, do they not make larges? Like I know like cyclists in general are usually very sort of slight, lean, people but it doesn't necessarily mean you're like sure Warren. yeah you you know we're 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 out of that time we need a little i want a little bit baggier purchase your gcn shirt so that when i'm in a random place i know who to ask for roots but just purchase a size up yeah say what you will about like the look of them and i also would never wear one but you gotta have like an admiration for the person who's gonna wear that in the sense that you can't even you cannot criticize them because they're like not in the fashion game. It's like that monologue that Omar has in The Wire where he he doesn't go after civilians, he only goes after people that are also in the game. This also applies to people in GCN t-shirts cuz they're so obviously not in the game that we cannot criticize them and we just have to admire them for being very genuine earnest people cuz we could never be that. Yeah, I mean, I disagree because this whole podcast about getting people into the game. We are going to do We Rate Your Bike for free. We have a very special bike to rate this week. It is Warren's new Standard cyclocross bike after Warren's uh, difficulties, to put it mildly, with carbon recently, Mm -hmm. which, um, you know, carbon's obviously in the canal. We've done that many times, but Warren has pivoted to becoming a full metal bike owner and has purchased a standard we ride metal bikes in this house yeah we ride metal bikes uh, on cycling fashion week and so uh, what i usually do here is i describe the bike before we rate it but uh why don't i give warren the honor of uh presenting his own bike oh wow i'm very honored i want to start off by giving a shout out to mike at uh, blacksmith cycles in toronto where i bought the frame this is the standard Stixage. As Alex mentioned, it is their cyclocross frame. They had one left in my size and Mike held on to it for me for a few days while I kind of like hemmed and hot a little bit. Yeah, I, I went for it because it is scandium aluminum and not carbon. And I've talked about my carbon issues enough in recent episodes that I don't need to go into it. So Okay, so why don't I talk a bit about this bike? So the frame, the colorway is called Leaping Lilac. <laughs> so it's sort of like a pastel, uh, light purple kind of pink. Uh, lavender. Uh, yeah, lavender. lavender. Yeah. Lilac. Um, and the standard logo is in sort of like this, it's almost like an acid lime, actually. Uh, like It is. That's yeah, what I was going to say. It, it, in person, it looks a little yellowish, I would say, but it, it's sort of like an acid yellow, acid lime. Uh, it has these like hit little hits of orange type on the frame that talk about how it's scandium tubing. It, I think it mentions the factory it's made in, made it because this frame is made in Italy, as uh, we talked about with Standard in our interview with them. Their um, aluminum bikes are made in Italy. And then the rest of the bike are all the parts that I ported over from. Uh, my ibis so i have a an easton cockpit a handlebar stem seat post uh easton is a sponsor of my race team in toronto uh for cyclocross so i've got i've been using easton parts for quite some time i actually like them i don't just use them because i we get a good discount uh they're actually really good i would recommend them um i've got a 
a fabric saddle for my wheels. I have stands, no tube grails, which are uh, a gravel wheel set. I do run tubes in them because tubeless sucks. Um, and then for my drivetrain, I have uh, a Shimano GRX one by setup. It currently is in a pretty gravel friendly setup with a 42 front ring and an 1142 in the back. So I have over a one to one ratio, which is going to be terrible for racing cross because I will almost certainly be too lazy to change it. And then I have a Rundell cages currently, but those will be coming off come cyclocross season. I'm just going to, I know you guys are going to rip me for it. Uh, I currently have 30 mils of spacers below my stem because it's a new bike. I'm getting the fit quite figured out. And the geometry on this bike is extremely aggressive, uh, especially compared to what I was riding on the Ibis, but I know I, I, I know I have to slam the stem. One thing I like about this bike so far is the cabling is fully integrated, but you can still use a normal stem and handlebar as I have here. So it's a very clean uh, look in terms of no cables. Tires, I currently have uh, some Vittorio Torino wets, which are mud tires, because uh, I've been riding some trails and, you know, I need as much... <laughs> grip as I can get. And then the handlebar tape is also Easton actually. And it's, nah, it's okay. Well, I wouldn't say you did quite as good job as Alex does of describing these bikes, but you did a good job. I think, you know, we're, we're good friends with standard now after maybe universal Alex ripped them a little bit, but they've come, obviously they worked their ma their marketing magic that Warren bought one like two weeks after we interviewed them. But mm -hmm. I think considering their marketing, I've I don't think I've ever seen a standard that wasn't slammed. I mean, I'm almost surprised they supply a steer tube long enough for someone not to slam it. But I think that if we want to get some sort of reshare, once you post this on Instagram, uh, the photo will have to have a slammed or I don't know, Photoshop it or something. Um, but it, honestly, it's a beautiful bike. I'm actually sort of torn because you don't have tan sidewalls. I, w I was going to ask, I mean, would some pan eraser gravel kings with tan sidewall not improve the overall look here and i i understand warren that you don't typically like to have tan sidewall on colors that are a bit colder like a blue no. for example and your your lavender here i think would fit in that category but you do have the orange lettering um in, in you know on the seat stays and on the top tube where I feel that the tan sidewall would, would pick up the warm, uh, the warmth of the orange. I have every intention of getting tan sidewall tires. I believe I bought these tires during a COVID shortage or something, or I couldn't, or maybe they don't even come in tan sidewalls. I'm not sure. I do have an actual set of, uh, what is the brand? Terravale cannonballs that are tan sidewall. So don't worry. Those are gravel tires, but for cross, Unfortunately, I don't think I have tan sidewalls, but I'll I'll try to get some before the the race season starts. Warren, what's wrong with the Arundel bottle cages? Why why do you want to take them off? Uh, just because racing cross, you have to shoulder your bike and stuff, and you're just showing your lack of knowledge of cycle cross, Alex. You don't you, you don't run cages and cross. It's instant canal. Baby. I wear my ignorance of cycle cross as a badge of honor. So look, Warren. I mean, I I want to hate on this. I. You know, I, I, I criticize the Standel pretty, pretty hard on this podcast for being the influencer bike company, but this is so nice. I, I don't know. I mean, I want to hate it, but I, I actually like it. And uh, I'm going to give you a 10 out of 10. I'm going to give it a 9.5 because even though there are Arundel bottle cages, they're not the metal ones. It's a metal bike. The metal bikes that have metal bottle cages. Yeah, I don't think the silver metal ones would go so well on this, though. I think they would look amazing. Yeah, personally. so do I. Mm. Is, should, is the, isn't that one of our rules that metal bikes have to have metal cages? Metal on metal on metal. I have carbon metal. cages on my road bike. Do you really? Yeah. I was unaware of that. That's upsetting. I feel like if the bike, if the frame is metal, then it should have metal cages. But if it's aluminum, I think it's a free for all. When I had the, the Richie cross bike, I had the metal Arundel. Yeah, that cages, tracks. And that looked good. Well, go find who you sold those to and ask for them back. Well, it was Universal Alex, so. <laughs> That's true. They're, they actually live on my on my Cannondale Saeco now, which, I mean, they found a good home. One thing I do want to say is the bike itself, like, I, I know this is the rating, the aesthetics, but I have to say the the ride 
quality, like the feel of the bike is, is almost on par with, with that Richie, which I have raved about the ride feel and the handling is way better than, than both the Richie and the, the carbon Ibis I had. And so it, it's been a great bike so far. I haven't ridden it a whole lot. I haven't raced on it yet, but I've been quite happy with it so far. And, and then the look itself it just kind of just makes me 10 watts faster just because it feels cool. But yeah, I definitely need to slam my stem. I know that. I mean, I, after all that criticism, I, I'm a Stondale guy now. <laughs> after listening to the episode that you did with them, and you know, when Warren sent hit photos of his bike to our, our Chad group, I at first I didn't want to admit it that it was so nice, but then I fell into a rabbit hole of going into Stondale's website and looking at looking at bikes there. And I'm I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation because my German isn't very good, but the Erdgeschoss uh, stainless must def uh the in the green and and i guess stainless steel you know gray or you know metal color oh my god this is so nice they have it on their website with pretty uh deep uh, dt swiss wheels and it's got that beautiful you know forest british racing green with the metal color and it is so nice. I'm I'm 100% a stand up bro now. I've wanted to replace the CAD for a while, and so I've, I'm now also a standard guy. That'll be the the bike Alex talked about. Maybe not. Maybe a different colorway or something. I don't know. But essentially, yeah, with a I'll be replacing the the Cannondale CAD with a CAD X with a, with some sort of gravel bike from Standard. Yeah, they've done magic. I'm waiting for us to get some like hate on all this love, and it's like it's not. Be- and the thing is, it's like not because of the interview. I mean, it is a bit because of the interview. But it's not like we were like, oh, they were nice to us. It's like genuinely like the what they said was very like honest. And then, you know, we all pushed Warren to get the bike because, I mean, he had to get something because that Ibis was like, what a shit show that was, man. But now that he's ridden it, I, I feel like, you know, he, he's given us honest feedback on uh, on how good it is. Honestly, like Max is almost like uh, ode to Scandium during the interview is really sold me on it, to be honest. And, you know, doing some reading on it and stuff, it. And so far, I would agree, it's only been a handful of rides, but um, credit to them, brilliant marketing to come on our podcast. Tip yeah. to, all the, to all the brands out there, good marketing. Okay, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10 for Warren's uh, standard. <laughs> we'll, we'll put some photos on our Instagram, at Cycling Fashion Week, comment, um, you know, leave your review, let Warren know what you would change on the bike, but very high marks for Warren. Das ist gut. Okay, that's it for another episode of Cycling Fashion Week. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Italian Alex. Thank you, Tony. But mostly thank you to uh, Steve and Ben from Attacker, our good friends in Australia, repeat guests, friends of the podcast. They have a great new collaboration with Kappa coming out. Check it out. It is very interesting, a lot of fun to talk to them as always. We will be back in a few weeks. We will be maybe watching the Vuelta. I don't know. It's in the canal. But in the meantime, do uh, get in touch with us on Instagram at Cycling Fashion Week. Or if you want us to rate your bike, or if you want to submit a canal, submit a Camille, you can do it sending us a DM on Instagram at Cycling Fashion Week or emailing us at cyclingfashionweek at gmail.com. Until then, be well and see you soon. (laughs) 